Yeah, okay, so uh, three things. Uh, the first is that it's customary as the last speaker uh, at a conference to make a joke um, about the low level of energy in the audience. This is that joke, and you may now laugh. <laughs> uh, the, the second is that there are two topics which I'm not going to be discussing today. The first is how to travel legally between two countries using planes. And the second is uh, today's date, as these are subjects on which I'm not an expert. Um, and the, in the spirit of proper uh, recursion, the third thing that I'm going to talk about is the talk itself. Uh, I'm also going to try and breeze through this pretty quick because we only have 25 minutes. But uh, let's start with a pretty simple topic. Um, what is going to be the impact of quantum computing on the things that we've been talking about for the rest of the conference, namely social and uh, economic justice? There are good things that quantum computers could do and bad things that quantum computers could do. And I'd like to, you know, present a few of these things, at least that you know, we, can, we can see out on the horizon. Uh, then I'm going to get down to proper business, uh, refresh everybody about the surface code, or introduce it for people who haven't heard about it before, as well as the problem of decoding, which, you know, I'm sorry, is not the process of going from an encoded state to an unencoded state, but it's related to decoding classical codes, and that's where the name comes from. So don't get tripped up there. And then I'll um, discuss briefly a couple of uh, CS algorithms that are accessible to the undergraduate uh, that you can use to increase the threshold of your surface code, uh, and you know how well does all this work? So, what's the what are the good things that quantum computing could do uh, for you know global justice? One thing is that we could uh, go from having the quantum cloud, you know, which is sort of insecure, and people can read what you're doing and intercept your communication, um, you know, and and govern you, uh, to having the blind quantum cloud which is going to be you know, uh, private or you know, oblivious and not watch you all the time. And that's, that's a great thing for computing. That's going to make our world safer, and it's going to make you know, uh, communication among people who aren't politically enfranchised much easier. That's nice. Uh, the other thing it's going to allow us to do is to generate uh, a new uh, batch or a new generation of quantum technologies you know, that will help us manipulate matter at the molecular uh, level, you know, possibly, maybe probably, with um, far lower cost in terms of energy and you know, maybe fewer harmful uh, byproducts. You know, this is a very plausible future for quantum computing, and it's all good stuff. Um, however, there's, a, there's you know, emerging uh, a picture of the interaction between uh, computing, especially machine learning, and society, and there are lots of negative effects to pay attention to here. Uh, people instinctively trust computers. They've seen too many movies, and they believe that computers are objective. Um, actually, computers do whatever you program them to do. Unless they're quantum computers, then they do a lot of random stuff, too. Um, and if we use these um, devices to start making important decisions, people are going to trust them more than they trust regular computers, but they're going to be less verifiable than regular computers. So it's, it, this could be an extremely dangerous uh, aspect of quantum computing, and it's one to watch out for, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but luckily, nothing so dangerous is happening right now. Um, what we have you know, is mostly harmless quantum computing. Uh, we have things like analog quantum simulation, where you try and build a device that has a Hamiltonian uh, that's the same, uh, at least as far as you can verify, with the system that you'd like to study. The problem with this is that any error you make in constructing that Hamiltonian isn't going to give you any obvious sign. right? If I do my simulation wrong, uh, you know, and I'm trying to simulate a unitary on a computer, I, I'm probably going to get a non-unitary operation out. And you know, that, you know, if I see my uh, norm of my wave vector exploding, I know something's wrong. Here, you're not going to know anything's wrong. You're going to predict physics, and it's valid physics, but it's physics in the device you built, not in the thing you were trying to build. There's also uh, variational methods that people are using uh, near-term quantum computers for. Uh, but the problem with this is that these are variational methods. Uh, they rely on an ansatz that you make at the beginning, and so you never know how far off your uh, output is from, say, the actual ground state or the actual ground energy of the system you're trying to study. Uh, and there are low-depth circuits for producing random numbers that are pretty close to uniform. Um, I don't know why you would want to do that, but it's called supremacy. Uh, when I think of supremacy, I think of a computer that can do everything better uh, because that's what supreme means. But you know, we, what we have here instead is a, a single sort of uh, application, if you can call it that, um, that 
that indicates that the computers are somehow working better than a classical computer, just not at anything that you would really want to do. Um, now, uh, there are a lot of people working on NISC, uh, and there's, there's a couple negative side effects of that. The first is that if we produce justifications for constructing uh, noisy small devices, other people will construct more noisy small devices. Uh, and I don't want noisy small devices. I want to have big perfect devices. And I hope uh, you do too. Uh, the second is that uh, the, uh, the amount of ideas that we're having about how to do large scale quantum computation is reduced because more people are working on the near term rather than making the far term into the medium term. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. As a side effect of this, the best idea we have so far for how to do large scale computations is to lay all the data qubits out in a square grid like this, uh, attach a bunch of local ancilla qubits to the system, uh, connect them so that any two qubits which are joined by a line can perform a, you know, an entangling operation like a C0 or a controlled Z. And then we use these, uh, these links and these ancilla qubits to measure stabilizer operators, which are a generalization of the parity checks that you would see in a classical code. Just checking to see whether four qubits uh, have either even or odd parity in either the X or Z basis, eigenbasis. Uh, those of you who are like super OCD will note that I have 25 data qubits here, but 24 of these check operators, which have to be satisfied, which leaves me with one effective degree of freedom. That's the logical qubit. And its uh, Pauli operators are continuous chains running from the top to the bottom for the logical X, or uh, going all the way across from left to right for the logical Z. And any two chains which do that always meet at one point, so they anti-commute just like the physical X and Z are supposed to. Uh, but these operators are big, uh, so it's hard to produce them by accident, right? Uh, five very specific things have to go wrong um, in order for one of these operators to happen by accident. So if we, want, if we want it to be harder for nature to perform one of these operations, we could just make the patch bigger. And we don't have to change anything else about the layout of the device, which is nice. You can kind of copy and paste. And uh, it makes engineers less sad than if you had to do it some other way with some arbitrary um, layout. So now I have three things that I'm going to talk about because it's a recursive third thing. Uh, in reality, you have to measure stabilizers as often as possible if you want to minimize error rates. And in order to detect whether some of those measurements are in error, uh, you have to compare different uh, measurement outputs that happen at different times, like at nearest neighbors in time. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is a scenario in which errors can only occur once at the beginning of the computation. Then everything else works perfectly. Uh, all of your ancillas, all of your connections work perfectly. And the, you know, the output is, is trustworthy. So you only have to do the measurements once. Uh, and the reason I'm going to do this is because it's, uh, uh, broadly speaking, difficult enough. Um, and the things that we learn in this simplified model will apply, uh, or at least they have applied in the past, to the more realistic scenario. Uh, right, so decoding is the process of inferring an error uh, given a bunch of these um, stabilizer measurement outputs called a syndrome, right, because it's a list of symptoms, things that have gone wrong with your state. And it looks something like this. So if there's, uh, if a few Z errors have occurred within this gray sausage, then they will be detected at their endpoints by X stabilizers with which they anti-commute. But if I have two Zs overlapping with two Xs, I get commutation. So these intermediate stabilizers don't detect anything. Uh, also, I can tell, depending on the type of the stabilizer, what the type of the error is. So this one says, you know, an odd number of Z errors have happened near me. Uh, and you know this one says an odd number of X errors have happened near me, and I see the purple dots, and I have to try and infer a set of gray links, right? Or I might also call them vertices and edges as a subtle hint of what's to come. And you can also note that a Y error will anti-commute with both kinds of stabilizers, so it produces this little four square of, of syndromes. Uh, now, as physicists, we love to make unjustified assumptions, so let's let's go for it. Uh, errors occur with the same probability on each qubit, p. Uh, those errors are independent, identically distributed x's and z's, and so a y error will occur with probability p squared. We're assuming a specific error model. Uh, your qubits work differently? Tough. We're making this assumption. Um, and if, if t here's the most technical assumption that we're going to make. 
if there are two syndromes that could be connected by a continuous chain of errors, then there is a specific chain of errors that we select to be the uh, chain that will connect them, right? So we leave out any question of, of degeneracy. Uh, and, then, and then we can do a derivation, or you know, not we, we can read the derivation. Dennis Kataev, Landel, and Preskill did the derivation in 2001. Uh, and I recommend that if you want to study the Torah code, uh, just go read their paper five times and redo all the derivations, and then you'll be like a world-class research expert on the topic. Uh, simple, but not easy. Uh, so here's the derivation. It fits on a slide, uh, and it only involves like high school math. You start with a uh, Bernoulli distribution that, you know, the probability that an error E occurs is just a function of the weight of the error. And then if you mess around, cancel stuff out that doesn't depend on the error itself, and take the logarithm, as all maximum likelihood method people will tell you to do, always take the logarithm, you end up with, you want to minimize now, because there's a minus sign, right? So to maximize this likelihood, you want to minimize the total size of the set of edges in, in a graph that you construct by linking all of the syndrome vertices together. Uh, and that's the same as minimizing the weight of the error, right? So whatever involves the fewest Paulis uh, on qubits is the likeliest. This problem was solved uh, in the 60s. People thought it was NP-complete for a while. Uh, but there's actually a cool and sort of complicated algorithm to do it, um, which I won't go into. But you know, the fact that you can get this neat little uh, objective function for your optimization is great. And it works pretty well. Uh, if, you know, if these were the only errors that would occur, the threshold error rate beneath which uh, higher distance codes work better is 10.3%. Uh, if you're above that error rate and you add distance to the, to the system, you only get worse performance. So please be below here. Um, the optimal uh, threshold against this error model is, is around 10.9%. Um, and this might not seem like a, an interesting gap to you, but I like to quibble over these little details all the time. So how come we can't hit that, uh, that threshold? And it's exactly because of this uh, degeneracy. At high error probabilities, large sets of degenerate uh, chains can become more likely than small sets of low weight chains. So for example, here we have you know, a chain that will connect this syndrome out to the boundary with a single error. These two are connected by two errors. These two are connected by two errors. So the total weight is five. But there's only one way to make that happen. You have to move in straight lines on this, uh, on this kind of checkerboard, right? Hopping around like a checker in order to make this happen. Uh, but if you look at these uh, purple chains, they're, they're weight six because you have two, two, and two. But there are 16 of them in total. Uh, so if the probability of error is higher than 1 16th, then it's more likely for an error from this set to have happened and then from this set. And the, the difference between these two sets is exactly one of those chains that crosses the entire lattice, right? So if you pick the wrong one, you've made a logical error. Uh, there is, of course, another problem. You know, if I assume that the error model is one way and it's another way, uh, this uh, y error could be weight two. It could happen with probability p squared in, uh, in a model where all qubits are, are uniformly depolarized. But you know, effectively, my decoder is assuming it's weight four. So if I ask what the minimum weight error is, it's going to say, well, for you know, the X syndrome, which is totally independent of the Z syndrome, I have a weight one correction. And the, you know, the Z syndrome over here, there's a weight two correction. And I'll be off by a logical X. If I take the product of all these three things, I get an X that just goes across here. So that's another way in which you can make a mistake uh, as a decoder. And that's why the gap is much larger if you do the depolarizing model the threshold you can achieve uh, with a naive minimum weight perfect matching implementation is around 15.4%. This depends a little bit on the boundary conditions, but I, I'm not going to get into it. You can ask me later. Uh, and the optimal would be around 18.9%, so a little bit bigger gap. And this can translate you know, for moderate distances if you're doing computations to about a factor of two in logical error rates. So if you want your computer to work twice as good, um, <coughs> increase this threshold up to the optimum, or at least, you know, do as much as you can. So how are we going to do that? We're going to use this trick that uh, uh, my friend Imran and I derived called multipath summation. Uh, so we're going to imagine that there are different probabilities of error on each qubit. Later, these are going to be the posterior probabilities from a pre-decoding step that we do. But for now, we'll just imagine that somebody gave us these probabilities. Uh, we will still only consider minimum length paths. So 
Um, you know, it is technically possible for some huge loopy path to connect two syndromes, but these things are, you know, suppressed with a big enough power of P that I'm going to say they don't matter and we'll just consider, you know, paths that are in that bounding box of minimum length paths that we'll see in a minute. Uh, also, we're only going to consider two possibilities for, uh, for any pair of syndromes. Either, the, either they're connected by a minimum length path or there's nothing at all uh, that, that is affecting any of the qubits that could connect them. So, and then any other uh, event, like there's a stabilizer somewhere or uh, there's two paths that connect the two vertices, we're not going to calculate anything to do with those. Uh, so if we make those, you know, still sort of unjustified but a little broader assumptions, we can redo the derivation from Dennis et al. Um, for now, setting OQ, the odds on qubit Q, to be PQ over 1 minus PQ, uh, we can factor out a bunch of 1 minus Ps, and then we end up with a product over the edge set as before. So we can still do minimum weight perfect matching, but now the, uh, the edge weight, you know, if we take the log, is going to be log of this sum product formula. And, you know, I really wouldn't like to sum over all of the paths that could create a given edge because there's a combinatorial explosion in the number of those. So I want to find some kind of clever algorithm that will do that for me. Um, so don't think, read. Um, in fact, read this book. Uh, don't read the whole thing, it's huge, but this is uh, Corman, Lyserson, Rivest, and Stein. And they have uh, a discussion of something called dynamic programming and optimal substructure and how to walk around on graphs, algorithms that do discrete operations like that. And basically, if you want to calculate the probability that a path moves from point A to point B, uh, or equivalently from point B to point A, direction here is, is arbitrary, right? As long as it's minimum length, right? It'll either be, you know, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, or anything in this little bounding box. Uh, suppose, for instance, that I already knew the probability you would get to here or here. What I would do is take probability of this times probability of crossing this qubit plus the probability of that times the probability of crossing this qubit, and I would have calculated the final result. So all I have to do is take, you know, basically a dot product of two vectors that are each length two and their probabilities, and I can do it. But how do I calculate the probability that I get to here? Well, I just have to calculate the probability to those predecessor vertices. This results in a, a, a parallel algorithm that runs in time linear with respect to the distance, because the maximum separation between these two things is the distance of the code. And any time I want to calculate, you know, a new rung on the ladder that will take me up to this qubit, I only have to do a constant amount of work at each of these vertices. Uh, so how do I get those probabilities that I, I insert into here? I'm going to rip off somebody else's decoder. This is from Pulan Chung 2008, uh, where they use belief propagation to try and calculate marginal probabilities of error on qubits. Uh, you associate a tiny computer with every ancilla qubit and a tiny computer with every data qubit, and they send each other messages. And here's what those messages are proportional to. Uh, they're normalized, so they're vectors of probabilities that have to sum to one. And what you do is you uh, sum over the three qubits that are in the support of a given check, right? C here is the ancilla vertex, and Q is the, the data vertex, or qubit. And you sum over all of the errors that match the syndrome that you actually see, and then you take the product of what's effectively there, uh, your, your current estimate of the probability of error. And then you update that probability of error uh, by taking the product with the prior probability and the messages that you get from the neighboring check vertices. So you can think about this like it's just recalculating marginal probabilities over and over again, but with the whole calculation being theoretically invalid because there are loops in the, uh, in the graph, right? Uh, a check can talk to a vertex, which can talk to another check, which can talk to the same vertex again. Uh, so this is not legit, but it works pretty well. Uh, one of the failure modes, though, is if you have two equally likely a priori uh, errors that produce the same syndrome, uh, belief propagation will get confused, and it will tell you that there's a 50% probability that that error has occurred uh, on either qubit. And if, well, okay, almost 50%. And if you just round these probabilities, you'll end up estimating that no error has occurred on either qubit, uh, and you'll be left with this syndrome unexplained. So you can't use belief propagation as a decoder in itself, but those probabilities are useful if you shove them into this path summation algorithm 
because that algorithm can say, well, this syndrome can go uh, you know, to a virtual vertex over here or over here, and there's a relatively high probability that it does either of those things. So the probability that we've that this syndrome matches out to the boundary, you know, going left or going right is still relatively high. And you get an, an edge weight that gives you a lot of confidence. Uh, how well does this work? Not optimally. Uh, for the boundary conditions I'm presenting here, which are slightly different from the ones that I talked about earlier, you go up to about 17.8%. Uh, so it's two-thirds of the way from naive to optimal. Uh, what are we going to do with this? Uh, well, okay, so first, uh, in, instead of uh, industrially produced baby boomer edge weights, we have artisanally handcrafted uh, millennial edge weights, and, the, and things work slightly better as a result. Uh, so yay, now I can have a participation sticker. Uh, there's some related work that takes account of degeneracy but not uh, model mismatch from Stace Barrett and Doherty in 09, uh, which is worth a read. They also make a connection to uh, entropic corrections in thermodynamics, so if, you'd l if you like spin models and entropy, um, feel free to take a look. Um, it's important to point out that we're using parallel algorithms with a time cost proportional to D because in the scenario where you are measuring at all times, uh, you can't afford to build up a giant backlog of syndrome data that you have yet to decode. You have to use algorithms that sort of act locally, even if you're thinking globally. Um, and so uh, belief propagation and multipath summation where there are classical computers associated to the qubits that pass messages to their uh, neighbors is, I think, a good paradigm for, uh, for operating and trying to increase the performance of decoding. Uh, let's see. So there's, there are a couple uh, questions that are, that are left that I'm working on that I had hoped to have done for the conference but don't. Um, can we have a single path that would go all the way across the lattice and tell us the probability that the two sides of the lattice are connected by a chain uh, that would create a logical operator. Um, maybe, but there are too many bugs in my code to tell whether it works yet. Um, also, you can express um, logical error probabilities as tensor network contractions or as the probabilities of, of measuring a certain result after you run a match gate circuit. Um, so if you're interested in fermionic linear optics um, or, or tensor networks and other efficient sub-theories of quantum mechanics, uh, you should take a look at Bravi Suchara Vargo 2014. Uh, and another question is how well does this all work if we're looking at the if we're looking at that 3D or two plus one dimensional uh, measurement record and trying to calculate the probability that a chain of of differences unites two inconsistencies? I suspect it will still work, but I don't have any data uh, to back this up yet. And with that, I'll take questions, uh, especially if you would like to ask me questions about this thing, uh, where I'm dual affiliated, which is like an online institute for uh, science. Okay, that is all. So thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. And thanks for making it on time. Um, questions? Um, okay, she wants the first. You actually um, acknowledged the question that I wanted to ask because I saw your affiliation on your first page, which is what is uh, IGDOR and uh, can you tell us more about that? Well, okay, so uh, a lot of people love science, but they don't really like universities. Uh, and, and, but they still want to get grants. So you're looking for an institution uh, that can host the grant for you, which is where you know, they vouch for you. They, they tell the, gov the granting agency that you're a scientist, uh, but you, know, you don't have any obligations other than to do work. And uh, IGDOR is, is trying to be something like that. There's like a dozen researchers uh, that are you know, joined together and we all list our affiliation um, on our papers and you get access to like an institutional email and a, uh, a VPN and there's like a co-working space in Bali, but I haven't been to Bali yet <laughs> to, to use the co-working space. But yeah, uh, if anybody wants to start a globally distributed independent um, quantum information research group and you know, we can all be like co-PIs and have a totally horizontal organization, uh, speak to me after the thing. So I have a funny question to prepare. Um, so you know Quitron is a very colorful conference, and some years ago I saw you giving a talk entitled Color Codes Are Fun. So why do you focus so much on surface codes? Is there any advantage of using color code approaches on 
this I think might generalize to other topological codes, right? This might generalize to other topological codes. Um, one of the things that's tough about a color code is that syndromes don't come in pairs uh, for a color code. They, they can come in threes. And so if you wanted to do a minimum weight matching uh, algorithm, you would have to use uh, hyper edges that, that will unite three different syndromes uh, using a single error. And while, um, while regular old graph-based minimum weight matching is uh, in P, uh, hypergraph matching with rank three hyper edges has been proven to be NP complete. Um, there might be some ways around this, uh, but that would be uh, a lot more work and maybe you'll see it in the future. I'm just gonna keep doing <laughs> variants of this forever. So every Q turn, you get another slightly better decoder. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so one question that I have is that there is this way of computing error thresholds that it's just you map your like error correcting problem to a classical uh, speed model with disorder, and then you compute the critical temperature, and that will give you eventually the the error threshold. So is that that threshold that you obtain that way? Is that some sort of like optimal threshold? And uh, and then if you run whatever algorithm that you have in mind, then you can approach to that. Can you beat that, or how how does that threshold relates to what you can compute just by running the code or the decoding? Uh, those thresholds that come from thermodynamics are right. what I quote here as optimal thresholds, uh, and they they neatly sidestep the question of how you're going to decode everything. That's right. And they they just look at you know thermodynamics or essentially sampling from this hugely degenerate ensemble uh, to see. Um, which errors go in which coset of the stabilizer, right. where there's a logical x, where there's logical y, where there's logical z. Um, but is that an upper bound for, for like your codes or, not, or can I'm you beat that? I am <laughs> pretty sure it is an upper bound. Okay. Um, I, would, I would go maybe 90% confidence. Okay. I'd be very surprised to see um, that anybody you can beat beating that, that bound. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Two small comments. I think in your talk you got two things wrong. One is the date of the at the beginning of the first slide. And here, your Twitter account, is this this one? Because we cannot actually find it. You <laughs> can't find my Twitter account? This is a crisis. The <laughs> <laughs> Screw the date, is it back? <laughs> um, I got my own Twitter wrong. That's three topics on which I'm not an expert. Okay, any more questions? Um. Maybe questions about my Facebook or? <laughs> I have a few scientific questions. Uh, so the first one is this belief propagation algorithm. Um, I guess you can actually probably um, write it down in terms of a tensor network. And eventually, you can probably, because eventually you actually um, want to end up with a probability distribution. So that would be the fixed point of this tensor network. But the problem is that in 2 plus 1, the it's kind of hard, like uh, even contracting and so on. Do we have a solution for that, or I mean, uh, somehow it, it kind of works, right? We know that it works, so yeah, it uh, may actually work with the tensor networks as well. Yeah. I definitely don't know how to uh, contract a tensor network in 3D, but I don't know how to contract a tensor network in 2 or 1D either. Uh, although no, 1D uh, I can uh, probably <laughs> do. 1D is actually dynamic programming, so I could do uh, that. Yeah, um, but. Uh, this is sort of a way to sidestep around tensor networks when you have different error models, different probabilities on each qubit, and, but when you're in a relatively low P uh, regime, right. because then you don't have to consider a lot of these you know, higher order terms. Yes. Um, maybe there is a way to smoothly interpolate between this sort of low energy approximation and a full tensor network based formulation of the decoding problem. And you're actually the second person to tell me that Belief propagation can be expressed as a, a tensor calculation, uh, but I have yet to understand how. Uh, every good tensor networker believes that um, everything can be explained. Oh, tensor. yeah, yeah, nice, so nice. <laughs> <laughs> so the I believe everything can be expressed using stabilizer <laughs> codes, but maybe stabilizer codes can be expressed using tensor networks. Oh, that's def definitely true. So. <laughs> um, so the other question is that um, do you actually, I mean, can you work with the coherent errors? like? You know, here you assume only one side errors. Um, yeah. Here, here I've assumed it's that it's Pauli errors uh -huh. uh, strictly for ease of simulation, 
right? Mm -hmm. So I use Goddess McNeil simulation. I actually use yes. a reduced Goddess McNeil simulation, which is even easier. Um, just you know, measure what anti commutes with a certain Pauli. It's I'm basically you're doing dot products with bit vectors. It's extremely um, simple when you want to do it on a computer. I mean, it's still easy to make mistakes, but um, conceptually, it's it's easy. For coherent errors, I would probably recommend some kind of brute force technique, uh -huh. like um, twirling them or uh, you know demanding that your uh, measurement results are plus or minus one and putting Pauli's on the on the lattice yourself at random. Um, so I, I can't directly simulate coherent errors, but um, yeah, the, the worst thing that, hap that can happen with a coherent error is your, your threshold will go down. So yeah. at least quantum computing stay is possible when you have these. Okay. Um, yeah, I have actually a few more questions, but maybe I'll, I'll ask it in private. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess at some point we also have to thank um, all the people who made it possible. But I'm not sure I'm the person who's supposed to do this. Is, uh, was there anyone who was planning to do this? Or was this inside of closing remarks? <laughs> yeah, let's first thank the speaker again. Yeah. <laughs>